Thanks, everybody, for, uh, for coming to this session, uh, Best Practices for Using Apache Spark on AWS. Uh, my name is John Fritz. I'm a senior product manager on, uh, for Amazon EMR, uh, service in AWS, quickly deploy Spark, Hadoop, other Apache big data frameworks quickly and efficiently. Um, before we get started, real quick show of hands, how many folks here have used Apache Spark before? OK, so a bunch of folks. How many people still use uh, Hadoop MapReduce or Tez or any other frameworks? A lot less. Um, how many people run Spark on AWS currently? Um, and then how many folks um, use EMR to run Spark today? OK, great. So some of this might be a refresher for some of you, but hopefully we'll get into um, some more granular details by the end. We'll take something away. Um, so quick for agenda, um, and overall of just quickly why we see Spark becoming very, very popular for uh, big data and machine learning applications. Uh, a quick section, just how to deploy Spark with Amazon EMR. We found that customers can utilize it to uh, get up and running very, very quickly in a performant way. Um, a little bit about EMRFS and just utilizing S3 as a data store and using other AWS services in conjunction with Spark when building your big data applications. Um, we'll talk a little bit about Spark on Yarn, and, and there's a bunch of different cluster managers you can use uh, to manage resources for Spark. EMR, we use Yarn, so we'll talk a little bit about that. A um, little bit about data frames and some performance tips. And then finally, a uh, quick overview on Spark security and a few ways you might want to set up your cluster to run it securely. Um, so Spark, you know, Spark uh, is becoming uh, very, very, very popular. The code base is moving quickly. Um, and people have been shifting their applications from using things uh, more like Hadoop MapReduce to using Spark instead as an execution framework. Um, and just overall gaining popularity. And there's a couple main reasons why. And the first reason, it's fast. Um, it's massively parallel like many of the other frameworks out there. But instead of, say, a traditional MapReduce framework that shoehorns things into a MapReduce uh, sequential uh, uh, sequence, it uses a DAG instead. It's just much more optimized in plotting an efficient query. Um, it also minimizes I.O. So instead of writing uh, to disk after each stage, it can store things in a data frame, RDD, um, you know, distributed in memory cache. Um, and that makes it fast because you can run sequential operations without incurring an I.O. cost. Um, and finally, it's more partition aware than Hadoop MapReduce as well. So you don't eat as much uh, shuffling time and network bandwidth. Um, but it's also just easy to use. Um, you know, instead of having to stand up Storm for streaming and you know, Hive for, for SQL and, and a bunch of different applications in the, in the stack, um, Spark really centralizes everything around the Spark core. Uh, if you want to run SQL, you've got a SQL interface, Spark SQL. Um, you want to run a streaming application, you've got Spark streaming. You want to run machine learning, you have a variety of distributed machine learning algorithms ready to be used, and you can also build graph databases. But all this is still around Spark Core. You don't have to worry about a bunch of different frameworks, and if you want to get in and tune it, you don't need to be an expert in all of that. You can focus in, in one area. Um, Spark also has a variety of uh, languages. Actually, could we start the timer real quick? Thanks. Um, uh, Spark, variety of language support is brought up. There's a SQL interface, but if you want to write your jobs in Scala, you can. You can write them in Python, common for the data science use case. Um, so I brought up SQL. Spark R and support for that is moving pretty quickly, and also Java. And it's just much easier to express things. Instead of writing you know, pure MapReduce code, which is an example, you know, a couple hundred lines, you can condense that into you know, tens of lines um, in Scala. So it's just much more efficient to, to write code. Um, Spark centers around abstractions. Uh, data frames is the main one now. It used to be RDDs and uh, got some extra features. Data frames is also data sets. It's really just a distributed collection of data organized in columns. Um, they're very, very easy to create. Then once you have your data set up in this way, um, there's a rich API to interact with it, transform it, um, and, and gain value from it. Filtering, aggregating, um, those sorts of things. Um, it's, when you're moving, some people have used Spark before. Um, Data frames is uh, more optimized than an RDD because it utilizes uh, the Catalyst Query Planner. RDDs didn't do that in the past. And then um, now there's also data sets, which essentially has some type safety around data frames. Um, also utilizes the Catalyst Query Planner, but you know, it's an object-oriented uh, uh, API. And there's, as I'll bring up uh, later in Spark 2, they're kind of converging in a way. But with Spark 1.6, this API is now in uh, in preview mode, so you can utilize it. Um, 
So data frames uh, are resilient. You know, it's distributed across all the nodes, and if one node goes down, the idea is that you'll be able to recompute it so that your, your in-memory data set is resilient to any failure. This is just an example of how Spark tracks the lineage of a data set, and then if you, know, you lose a node, node comes back, and it'll recompute that, that uh, block based on the previous um, changes that you've uh, operated on the, the data frame or RDD. Um, they're very, very easy to create. Actually, I'll show a quick demo of, of how easy it is to create from a Parquet file. It basically just you know, reflects the schema in, and you already have a data frame loaded that you can play with. Um, but it's really rich support for JSON, Parquet. If you have tables in Hive, you can easily create a data frame and pull that into memory from those tables. Or if you just have a Spark RDD, you can easily create a data frame from that. Um, but there's lots of third-party packages that you can add that add support for creating data frames from a variety of more sources. If you have data in Cassandra, you can pull that data in. Data in Elasticsearch, you can pull in or load from Spark. Um, we've seen a lot of movement on the Amazon Redshift connector um, as well. You can download that, load it in your cluster, and then basically pull data out of Redshift via um, kind of a staging area in S3 under the hood into your cluster, or if you're running an ETL process, load the output into Redshift. Um, data frames, you know, is, a, is a, the core concept. Once you have things in a data frame, you can, you can uh, create machine learning algorithms, train them, um, you know, extract features, that sort of thing. Um, Spark has a variety of distributed um, machine learning libraries. It used to be called MLlib, now it's just referred to as ML. Um, and that also is moving very quickly. More algorithms are being written. Each uh, algorithm is becoming better and better and more performant. Um, so there's a lot of uh, activity there. So it's a very easy way to stand up distributed machine learning pipelines um, easily. Also, there's some new features that came out in Spark 1.6 and are even more standard in Spark 2 around pipeline persistent, meaning that it's very easy to create a model and then create a pipeline around training and fitting it, but then saving that to S3 and then loading it in really whatever language uh, you want that Spark supports. Um, so it just makes it easier when you're writing these things in the flow to be able to, to save them and load them in a, in a performant way. Um, data frames also are used in streaming as well. Um, and I'll go over this changing a little bit in Spark too, but you, know, you create basically uh, like micro batches, so very small RDDs that are you know, a short time window, and it's, it's a D stream, that's what it's called. And um, you know, you're able to basically write uh, your jobs on these kind of incremental micro batch data sets um, in a similar way that you could write it in batch. So it's actually Spark is adopted a lot in Lambda architecture where you have a streaming layer and an at rest layer, mainly because it's very easy to write a job that can interact with both of those data sets. If you think of like an incoming stream as an infinite table and then uh, your at rest data um, that's static as uh, you know, a discrete table and being able to join the two. So we find that is a, is a common use case, but once again, because everything's around the same core, it's very easy to write um, you know, a processing job that can use both a stream and static data sets. Um, I brought up Spark R. Uh, Spark R is a relatively uh, you know, new uh, uh, API in uh, Spark. They're working on bringing more distributed algorithms for the machine learning uh, libraries into Spark R. The support isn't necessarily one-to-one -one yet, but it's moving quickly. And we see a lot of promise with people, uh, data scientists, who want to write R in a distributed way using Spark to achieve uh, that scale. Um, I brought up Spark SQL. Uh, you know, once you cache things in a data frame, you can get very, very low latency access to it, lending itself really good to, say, a, a BI query um, or you know, data science in that way. And a lot of that work is still done with SQL. Um, and you can also you know, store, store your schema in a Hive Metastore, which is also a ubiquitous way to store, almost like as a data catalog. Um, and you can connect via JDBC and ODBC with Spark Thrift Server. Um, you can use you know, a variety of interfaces. But we're seeing that becoming very popular um, with SQL developers who want low latency access um, to large data sets. Um, so Spark 2, I brought that up a little bit. Right now, uh, the latest GA version is Spark uh, 162, but Spark 2 is in the voting phase. There's been a few release candidates that come out. Hopefully, uh, the community will vote on it soon, and it will be announced GA in, in the coming weeks. Um, EMR is, is quick on supporting the new Spark version, so you know, after it's GA, I'd, I'd expect to see it in EMR uh, soon after. Um, a few changes in Spark 2. and. Um, you know, if, if you want to start playing with it, you can pull down uh, the release candidate and actually bootstrap it on an EMR cluster or just, you know, play with it locally. Um, there's a few interesting updates. One is SQL support has gotten a lot better. There's a new ANSI SQL parser. 
um, data frames and data sets have, the, the data set portion has um, moved, moved a lot from 1.6 to 2, and it's now being united essentially with data frames. I think data frames is now going to be like a subset of data set. So instead of having these two separate APIs, they're now more merged. And actually, it's the same thing with the Spark context and the Hive context. Before, if you wanted to use the Hive QL with Spark, you'd create a Hive context, which made it easier to say port your Hive jobs over to Spark. Now they're merged, and you create just one, and Spark will decide um, what mode to use. Um, better support for Spark R, new algorithms are included. Um, and the ML pipeline uh, persistence, which is really integral, and when you're developing pipelines, being able to save and iterate on them, um, wasn't supported in all language, and now it's more ubiquitous in the Spark ML uh, feature set. Uh, Spark 2 also has shown to be a fair amount faster. Uh, it's a second generation uh, engine that's now uh, c creating a bunch of uh, custom code per job. Um, so a lot of low-level operations are running much more quickly. Also, just the general query planner, there's been improvements there. And there's a, a few other things like a vectorized parquet decoder to improve throughput when you're pushing things down and reading parts of uh, the parquet file format, uh, different columns. Um, and a final big change is kind of a revisit of Spark streaming. So as I brought up before, um, you know, you, you use, utilize the DStream and you wrote jobs that were kind of a little bit separate from, from, your, uh, from your batch jobs, although there, there is close interplay and that's what makes it good for building a Lambda architecture. Structured streaming is basically rethinking it on, you know, how can you make it almost opaque to a user, um, whether they're writing a data uh, processing job for batch or streaming, and really build kind of hooks that the same job really could be used for both. If you think about streaming data as, you know, a table that's just a dynamic table in nature versus a static one. So there'll be a lot more coming there over the uh, uh, subsequent releases of the Spark 2 branch. Um, so there's a little bit of overview on Spark. I'll go into a little bit on uh, creating uh, Spark clusters quickly with Amazon EMR. What we found in AWS is you know, it's, it's really great to prototype and build applications and then move them into production. And speeding that process up means you know, a quicker return on data coming in, being able to utilize your data better, build uh, stronger businesses with more insight. So speed is important and ease of use, and also spending more time developing uh, your applications uh, instead of worried about you know, standing up Spark, managing Spark clusters, and that sort of thing. Um, you know, we've, we've seen customers use EMR and comment on several areas of, of where they found value. Easy to install and configure Spark. Um, and that's one thing. If you want a Spark cluster in you know, around five minutes with a notebook interface, you can click a few buttons and you've got one. And you can scale it out to, to thousands of nodes. Um, also, it's easier to, to remove capacity and, and uh, add capacity depending on you know, how many nodes you need running, how much memory you need for a data frame, how many cores you need, that sort of thing. Um, there's a variety of different ways that you can uh, interact with the cluster, and I'll go through a few when thinking about how to build these pipelines. You know, do you want a long-running cluster that's always up serving requests? Do you want to leverage a transient architecture? Um, you know, there's a bunch of different options there. Um, variety of different ways to save costs using, um, you know, in the end, you're, ru you're running on EC2 and you have the, avail uh, the ability to use the different pricing models that are for EC2. Um, secured, we'll go over some of the security features at the end. And then finally, just the general idea, and it sounds like a lot of people here are running Spark on AWS, so it sounds like I'm preaching a little bit to the choir, but on using S3 and decoupling your storage layer from your compute layer, um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more as well. You can save costs, um, increase the durability of the data, and not need to over uh, provision a cluster for HDFS. Instead, you only provision the compute you need to uh, run the processing that you need to do. Um, so create a, uh, EMR create a fully configured Spark cluster uh, in a few minutes. Uh, there's an excerpt from the console. Um, we have a, that's kind of the quick create easy page. It's just one thing, a few options. You hit go and you have a Spark cluster. We have a more you know, in-depth way of uh, UX of, of configuring these things as well. But if you don't want to deal with any of the custom stuff, you can just get a cluster with Spark. Um, but everything is API driven. So in the AWS CLI, that's an example of a command that would give you a eight node Spark cluster. It's really that easy. Um, or you can uh, use the SDK and build your own programs that call and create and submit work to Spark uh, clusters running in EMR as well. Um, EMR supports a variety of different instance types, and actually, that's uh, you know one of the advantages of AWS is there are the um, many different instance types you can choose to really tailor um, the hardware to your workload. So, you know, we see people running Spark on all of these uh, instance families. We obviously see a lot of R3 because it's um, the memory optimized instance type. So if you want to cache a large data frame, 
that's a that's a very efficient way to do it. But we do see some people just running, you know, M M3, M4 because they have a processing job. They don't need to cache the entire data frame. They don't want to pay for it, and they just want to use more general hardware to go run it. So um, we see a, a lot of different um, instance types uh, being used. Um, it's worth mentioning here that also EMR integrates with EC2 Spot. Um, actually, how many people here are familiar with the EC2 Spot market uh, bid pricing? Um, that's great. EC2 spot allows you to bid for capacity, and assuming that the, the market price, which is a dynamic price, um, is lower than your bid price, you'll get that uh, hardware for the price that you bid. And oftentimes, you can save up to 90% on your underlying compute costs. Um, one thing to note is that if the market price goes above what you bid, um, the spot market will reclaim that instance um, from you. But because Spark um, you know, it's a distributed system and can handle node failures. If you have a mix of on-demand instances where you pay uh, you know, an hourly rate and no one's going to take it away, um, and spot, you can oftentimes save a lot of money but still have enough availability to run whatever job you need to, or you just rerun the job. Um, a variety of options we see customers submitting sp uh, Spark jobs in AWS. Um, if you're running an EMR cluster, um, EMR actually has an API called the EMR Step API, which is a sequential, um, basically, add job API. You can call the EMR API and say, add step, here's where my jar is in S3 with my application, run it. And EMR uh, service will grab the jar, give it to Spark on the cluster, Spark will run it, and you know, then the output, uh, you can say, you know, if this job uh, succeeds, then go to the next one. There's a bunch of different... Um, uh, settings you can put on what happens at the end of that job. That's a very, very easy way. It's also if you're running a transient architecture by spinning up a cluster, you know, a couple minutes it's up, you run the job and want to shut it down, you can uh, embed uh, in your create command a bunch of steps to basically create a process of create the cluster, run all these jobs, and then when it's done, shut everything down. So that's one very common thing for just routine batch processing. Um, another way that we've seen customers uh, launching Spark jobs is using AWS Lambda. Um, in the case of EMR, you can tell Lambda to submit a step to EMR, or you can have Lambda actually interact directly with the Spark API on the cluster um, using SSH. Um, Lambda also has uh, like time-based things as well. So if you have a workflow you want to kick off at you know, noon every day, you can tell Lambda, hey, do this job at noon, and it'll go work. So it's a very, very um, easy way to set up kind of easy uh, workflows. Um, but if you have a more complex workflow, um, like, you know, run a Spark job and then uh, wait for another job to finish and then, you know, join the two with another job um, that you need to draw out. Um, we, you can use AWS Data Pipeline, which is another uh, AWS service where you can draw complex workflows and have conditions on, you know, when things are upload to a bucket, then kick this thing off. So there's very, very fine granularity on the different types of workflows uh, you can create. Um, but we also see customers using a variety of other tools running um, off of the Spark cluster and you know, either provisioning Spark clusters or interacting with others. A few popular ones are Airflow, which is Airbnb's open sourced uh, workflow designer. If, if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. It's a very powerful tool. Um, Luigi and there's a variety of other uh, you know, workflow designers as well um, that, that uh, we've seen people use. Um, there's a few options actually on the cluster as well, though, um, and all these are, are pretty easy to install in EMR uh, with a couple of clicks. Uh, one is just using web UIs. Uh, we ship Zeppelin with EMR. Zeppelin is an open source uh, notebook tool, and actually I'll show it on the demo in a minute. Um, but it, you know, there's rich visualizations on results. You can collaborate on it, um, export notes, load notes, save it to S3. So it's a very versatile tool. Um, but you can also install things like RStudio. That, uh, Screenshot there is from the AWS Big Data blog about a post doing geospatial analysis with Spark and Spark R and EMR, and they hooked up R Studio. You can you have root access over all the nodes. You can do whatever you want. You can install whatever uh, components you'd like. Um, if you choose, you can also install Uzi on EMR. Uzi is a it's been around for a long time. It's the Hadoop you know workflow orchestrator tool. Um, it does have support for Spark. Um, so if you have a complicated DAG of Spark jobs that you say want to run at a regular rate, you can define that in Uzi either in an XML or using the Hue interface, um, and Hue, yeah, using the Hue interface, and uh, and run those as as, you, as need be. I brought up before you can connect to Spark and submit jobs via ODBC and JDBC using the Spark Thrift server. Um, in the case of EMR, we actually have the Spark Thrift server 
on the master node of the cluster, we just don't start it because it'll automatically create a Yarn application. And for people who don't want to use the Spark Thrift server, they might not be happy that there's a, you know, a Yarn app being forced on them. So it's quite easy to start. You just run that command, and it'll come up. And then you connect um, via the driver that, that you'd like. Um, and there's a variety of other things, too. The community has really adopted Spark and has built um, you know, many different job submission, uh, I guess, applications that you can use in conjunction with Spark. Um, Spark Job Server is a popular one, originally open sourced by Uyala. Um, and that almost gives you a REST interface and also the ability to share um, one of these cache data frames among a variety of different users, which, which is useful if, say, you have a bunch of different teams that all want to access the same shared data set. That's an efficient way to, uh, to architect that. Um, you can just use the Spark shell. Um, there's another job server called Livy, which um, is used in oftentimes in conjunction with Hue that's being developed. So there's a, a variety of different ways um, to, to interact with Spark and submit work. Um, so mo for modern debugging, um, if, you, if you choose to run Spark on EMR, uh, you can select to push the logs to S3. So if you run, tra the idea is, you know, you might want to shut your cluster down after a job so you don't have to pay for it, but we don't want to penalize you by, say, deleting all of your logs. So we push the logs to a bucket you specify in S3 so you can see what happened after your job is completed, and you can, you know, browse them in the MR console. Um, but we also have the Spark UI available, which is just the open source front end. Um, and it's pretty powerful. It shows you uh, visualized, um, uh, you know, graphs of the performance, but also when certain executors kick in, shows you the logical query plan. There's a lot of, if you want to get into the details of what happened in your Spark job, the Spark UI is typically a good place uh, to start. Um, we also have Ganglia for monitoring cloud watch metrics. There's other tools as well if you decide that you, you do want to go into the details and, and tune your cluster or debug things. However, if you don't, um, you know, EMR configures everything off the bat, so you should be able to get some mileage out of Spark without even having to touch anything. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, Spark is being adopted all across the board for a variety of different use cases. Here's some uh, customers who are running it on uh, EMR today. Um, Yelp's doing machine learning and ad targeting, ranging to uh, GumGum doing revenue forecasting, uh, Crux for personalization, uh, Crowd, uh, CrowdStrike, which is basically running through logs to find patterns to see if there's any um, threats. Uh, so a variety of people just leveraging Spark for uh, you know, big data use cases. Um, one, one thing that we see a lot of is Kinesis to Spark streaming. So one popular use case for real-time recommendation systems or just any real-time analysis is um, you know, ingesting your data in through Amazon Kinesis, which is a you know, highly available streaming data platform in AWS, um, and have Spark, uh, Spark streaming has receivers that make it easy to connect to Kinesis and also um, utilize checkpoints. There's actually a blog on the AWS Big Data blog that goes into detail on standing up uh, this sort of architecture with checkpointing, which is highly recommended just to improve the durability of your stream. But you know, data comes into Kinesis, and you run you know, a windowing function or some sort of um, you know, real-time roll-up function in Spark. And then you can load the extract into Redshift. You can write it out to S3 for further downstream processing. You know, once it's into AWS, you can use the variety of different um, processing services available uh, in your big data architecture. Um, GumGum, another example. Um, they're actually using Spark for a variety of different um, processes, which shows, once again, the versatile uh, nature of Spark as a platform. Uh, they're running a 24-7 cluster in EMR that just has a RDD for interactive dashboard based on uh, rev you know, revenue forecasting and other uh, business metrics. And because it's cached in memory, it's always there, you can get very, very low latency to populate uh, dashboard at interactive speed. Um, but they also just have a bunch of clickstream logs coming in. Those logs enter S3, and then every so often, they'll kick off a Spark cluster. It'll be up in a couple of minutes. They'll run an ETL job, transform the data, um, and then load it into a Redshift table, the aggregates, um, you know, for their data warehouse uh, about customer behavior. And finally, because they're pushing all the data into S3, um, they can run experiments, understand whether it might be worth, say, standing up a new production workflow, what insights might it drive. And they've armed their data scientists with the ability to just create a transient Spark cluster, start playing around with the data, and see what they can find. But they shut it down when they're not using it. So they don't have to be fully invested in running that cluster all the time. They can pull it up when they want to run experiments and then shut it down. Um, final example, and this actually just came up uh, on, the, on the Big Data blog on Friday. I thought it was pretty cool. Um, Amazon.com's personalization team, so a retail website, um, is using Spark on EMR in conjunction with a new deep learning 
um, library that we release, DSSTNE. Um, and they're actually doing an interesting thing here where they're uh, utilizing Spark on EMR to run the compute heavy pre-processing workloads, but DSSTNE runs on GPUs. It's not a, a Spark library like MLlib, and they're actually uh, running it in ECS and basically handing off um, the shards from different RDDs to S3, and um, the, the uh, ECS cluster is picking those up and they're running a bunch of, these are two different workflows that they have because some things need to run and communicate, other things are just very independent and you just scale them out. Um, but, but running those um, you know, deep learning algorithms on the data and then creating recommendations for the Amazon.com website. So very cool blog, I highly encourage reading it. Um, but here once again shows just, it's very easy to uh, leverage Spark for, for data processing workflows. Um, let me quickly show you Zeppelin. Um, We could cut to the demo, please. Cool. Um, so, uh, one second here. That clutter. Um, so, here's a view of the EMR console. Um, and uh, as you can see here, here's a cluster that I uh, created. Um, earlier this morning, but it took about five minutes to, um, to, to come up. And uh, as you can see here, it's running Spark uh, 161. Um, and this is uh, EMR 471, so this is the, uh, the latest version of EMR. Um, so I created an SSH tunnel uh, to this cluster, to the master node where all the web UIs are running. And uh, here is the Zeppelin notebook. Um, we have the Spark UI and Ganglia and then the Hadoop Resource Manager. Keep in mind, this is running in Yarn. Um, and so I just want to show you real quick just how easy it was. You know, a couple of clicks, um, you can set it up uh, literally by going to uh, the Create Cluster, and you, or I could clone this. Um, if I wanted to create this cluster on the AWS console, I could use that, um, and then just hit Run on the console. Um, so Zeppelin here, which is a popular front-end notebook for Spark, uh, it just makes it very, very easy to collaborate on Spark jobs and just iterate fast. Um, in this case, uh, there's a data set that I put in S3 of all the flight data for um, domestic flights for the last, I think, 20 years or so. Um, and it's in uh, Parquet file format, so columnar format. Um, and you can see how easy it is. This is an S3, you know, it's actually, there's a bunch of demos on, on the web. You can even load this in your own cluster. It's a, a public data set to use. Um, and just show how easy it is to get in a data frame. You just reference the folder where all those Parquet files are. Um, you uh, then, you know, create a, create a data frame here and then register a table. And Spark will infer the schema from it. So I didn't have to enter in, you know, one of these like massive hive create table statements. You just three lines and now I have a data frame. But then what I can do um, is I can cache it um, here, so now it's all in memory, and then run you know, a variety of different uh, queries on it. Zeppelin has interpreters for the different languages. I chose to use SQL, but you could use um, you know, Python, Scala, you know, whatever, whatever language you feel more comfortable with. But you, know, you can write the notes, here's what's running, and in a couple of seconds um, you'd get the results. Um, just for completeness, I'll rerun these show that this is live. Um, counting the rows looks like uh, 100 million rows or so. Um, here's a query that finds the airport with the most canceled flights in the last, since 2000. So if you're flying through Chicago, um, you might be staying there for a bit. Um, <laughs> the visualization here is pretty rich. Um, there's a bunch of different graphs, uh, you know, interactive, and we found that just it's good to collaborate. You can export this notebook um, and save it. Uh, and then give it to somebody else and they can iterate on your queries and, and uh, send it back to you. A uh, quick look at the Spark UIs. This is also running on the master node of the EMR cluster on, on this port. Um, and as you can see here, you can see all the jobs that have been run. You can take a closer look um, at a specific job. You can visualize the DAG. And you know, a lot of this stuff you might not need to go look into, but if, say, you want to really tune a query or you're hitting some sort of performance bottleneck, it's a good place to start. Um, you can also get some information on what RDDs you have, or what data frames you have stored. In this case, I've cached around 40 gigs in memory across my executors. Um, you can see what executors you have active. 
and you can see um, the uh, uh, query uh, plans uh, for SQL queries that you might run here. So lots of details, quick access to logs as well. Um, you can use it or not, depending on um, how deep you want to get in to Spark um, and tune your jobs. Here you can see Ganglia, um, which I've also installed. It's very useful for monitoring. You can see here um, the aggregate uh, cluster memory. Um, this is how much I've been using, cache the data frame. Um, you can see here networks whenever I run a job and things start chatting, that registers. And you can also see here that's at an aggregate cluster level. You can drill down into node level metrics as well. So you can see here these are each of the executors and they've been caching more memory and then the, the master is not utilizing as much memory because it's only running the driver. And then um, the Hadoop uh, resource manager UI. One, one question is, is because we're running it in Yarn, people wonder where, where is the Spark UI because it's not in Spark standalone where the Spark UI is in the master. And I'll go into a little bit of the Yarn architecture in a minute, um, but it's actually in the application master. So if you're looking for the Spark UI, um, you go here and it'll come up and it's, it's running in the application master process, which is running on a, on a you know, random node manager uh, in the cluster. All right, could we go back to the slides, please? All right. Thanks. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about uh, utilizing Amazon S3 as a persistent uh, store for Spark. Um, and there's a couple main reasons why you might want to consider using S3 when you're, when you're running Spark in AWS. First is it's designed for 11.9s uh, of durability. Um, it's very durable, it's very low cost, and also very, very scalable. Um, we have customers running multi-petabyte data warehouses in S3 can manage that scale. Um, and you don't have to manage it versus something like HDFS where you have to keep adding data nodes for more storage, you have to manage uh, your name nodes, and you, know, you have to then, if you have a HDFS cluster in an AZ, you need to back that up to probably another AZ or S3 anyway. But another important thing is that it changes the cost dynamics of running Spark. So you know, before you need an always on cluster because you needed um, HDFS always there, because um, that's you know, your data store. And so your cluster's up, and a lot of times you have very underutilized compute um, or memory because your, your cluster's up mainly for the storage capacity. Also, you might have provision more nodes than you need because you need you know, extra data nodes to performantly run HDFS, even though you might not need that many cores or aggregate memory across your cluster. Um, so when using S3, you've decoupled the two, meaning that you can have a cluster up or not. It doesn't, you know, when you're not processing anything and you, you know, you're not waiting for an incoming request, why do you need a cluster up and why do you need to pay for it? So it allows you to really separate the two, size your cluster for the, the workloads you need, or even run different hardware for different workloads. If there's a workload, they'd be happy running on a, a general optimized instance. You can use something like M3 if you had a workload that requires a lot of memory for large RDD. You could use R3 um, and, and really customize the cluster for the workload if you want to get granular. Um, there's a bunch of different S3 connectors. Um, EMR, we utilize a proprietary one, EMRFS. Um, but you know, all the S3 connectors implement the Hadoop file system interface. Um, we've done a lot of testing. I mean, you know, the vast, vast majority of EMR customers are using S3 in some capacity. Um, so you know, a lot of just incremental um, changes over time, you know, error handling, improved performance. Um, it's transparent to applications. All you do is specify the S3 scheme, and instead of reading and writing to HDFS, you're you know, reading from S3 directly into memory, you're writing out directly to S3. You're not actually copying any data back and forth before processing. Um, we support a bunch of the S3 encryption features. We'll talk a little bit more about security at the end. Um, but if you're using server-side or client-side encryption, once again, it's transparent to Spark. It's pushed down into this uh, connector level. Um, and then also we have some uh, list consistency features and fast listing as well. Um, a few tips for S3, and this is just general S3 tips, whether you're using uh, EMR or not. Um, to, to get the best performance, uh, one thing you want to do is make sure that you have optimized your list performance. And, um, and you also you want to optimize throughput. Um, in the case of like time series data, a lot of times you'll organize things, say, by day, and you'll typically process, say, the last day. So most of the data that you're actually accessing is under the same S3 prefix in the bucket. Um, but under the hood, that actually puts it on some of the same uh, key map servers 
which would, um, you know, if you're hammering it, hammering it for a list, you know, it might degrade your list performance. So what we've seen customers who are running at scale do is hash the prefixes so that even though from like a logical standpoint, you're querying the data from you know, the last month, each day because of the prefix is, is almost random, is being pushed across a variety of different servers so you get a better list performance and better aggregate throughput. Also, utilizing uh, columnar formats is really good as well because you're just pushing less data over the wire. If you say you have your data set in parquet and you're filtering by certain columns, you're only taking that column and bringing it back versus um, bringing everything back. So choosing a columnar file format if your queries are only selecting, say, some subset of columns is also recommended for that reason as well. Um, you know, another tip is if you have your data in uh, S3, meaning that you know, you're basically stateless outside of any one cluster, you can also store all of your tables if you want to store tables, say, in Hive and, and create data frames from those out of the cluster as well. When you create an EMR cluster, if you create a Spark cluster, um, the Metastore is going to be running you know, locally to the cluster. But you can change that setting and actually run the Metastore database in uh, something like Amazon RDS, which when you shut the cluster down, your tables are still there. You can bring the cluster back up. It'll connect to that remote Metastore, um, and you'll have your tables back. So thinking about that, you know, making sure that each, each component, if it doesn't need to be stateless, you don't need to store anything in it. Or the stateful, you don't need to store anything in it. Um, Spark can work pretty well with a variety of different um, AWS data stores. Uh, in EMR, we have a DynamoDB connector, which works with Spark SQL and with Hive. So if you want to uh, read or write to DynamoDB, Amazon DynamoDB is a highly available uh, NoSQL data store in AWS. Um, you, you can use that connector to, to integrate those two. Um, you can connect to Amazon RDS using the JDB, JDBC data source of Spark SQL, or you could actually use Scoop with Hadoop MapReduce as well, depending on um, you know, what, what, uh, what you're using for that application. Uh, there's an Elasticsearch connector with Spark. There's a Spark Redshift connector, which um, you can download and, and pull in. Um, there's a bunch of different streaming uh, connectors as well. We see a lot of customers uh, ingesting into Amazon Kinesis into Spark streaming, but you can also use something like uh, Apache Kafka. Um, and then finally, um, also using S3 as well, which I brought up before, is, is a very common way for customers to store large data sets and then process them with Spark. Um, okay, next we'll go over a few slides on just Spark architecture and how you run it in EMR. Um, EMR, we run Spark on Yarn. Um, there's a, a few reasons, um, but one of the main ones is that uh, we also run the rest of the Hadoop stack. So a lot of times customers might want to run Hive and MapReduce or Hive and Tez and also Spark. And Yarn does a very good job of managing all these different applications together. Um, when you run a Spark application in Yarn, um, you know, as, as you see here, the Spark driver, um, you either run it in client or cluster mode. The driver is basically um, you know, the application that then will go and uh, request resources and run, runs the, uh, the app versus the executors which actually do the execution of, of what the driver is coordinating. When you run the driver in client mode, it runs uh, on EMR on the master node and is a Yarn client. So it'll go request resources from Yarn. Yarn will spin up an application master, but the driver is still running on you know, wherever you've started that process. If you run uh, the Spark application in cluster mode, the driver actually becomes embedded in the application master, the Yarn application master, which is then going to run somewhere in the cluster and not on the actual node where you, you said use Spark submit to submit the job. Um, uh, Spark executors run in Yarn containers on node managers. So the executors are the workhorses of the job. Um, and those are basically run on all of the slave nodes. And you know, there's, we'll go over in a minute on ways to tune them and also just the, some of the default settings that we use in EMR to, to run those. Um, there's a few good features on Yarn that uh, there's also reasons beyond just the fact that it's ubiquitous in the Hadoop world. Um, besides you know, dynamically sharing across different applications you might want to run, um, there's a bunch of different schedulers you can use. There's a capacity scheduler, the fair scheduler. Um, you can allow Yarn to do more dynamic resource management of the actual Spark job using dynamic allocation, which I believe is being rolled out to some of the other um, resource managers as well. Um, but it was originally started with Yarn. Um, and finally, you can uh, Kerberize Yarn for authentication. And I'm not sure if, uh, I don't think Spark standalone supports that yet. And Mesos um, might support it soon or might already. By default in EMR, we use the capacity scheduler. And we have one queue. So you submit a job, we run it. But if, say, you had an organization with a variety of different people 
who uh, need to run Spark jobs, and you want to make sure that there's going to be capacity for them, um, you can set up a bunch of different queues and have uh, folks tag the job they want with the queue that it gets run in to make sure that um, uh, capacity is guaranteed for that job to run. Um, and these are all configurable via yarn config, but by default, um, we use the uh, capacity scheduler. There's also the fair scheduler as well, which will divvy up resources, um, I believe, just fairly among all the jobs that request, request those resources. Um, so we talked a little bit about uh, kind of the different schedulers Yarn uses. Now, when it creates a job, you, uh, Yarn will then run, Spark will request a bunch of uh, executors to actually run the job. So what is an executor? Um, these are the processes that are run on all the slave nodes that store the data and also run the tasks for your Spark job. Um, they're specific to a Spark application. So when uh, you know, Yarn spins up the uh, Yarn app for Spark um, and you then create another Spark job, it will spin up a new set of executors. If you want to you know, execute on the same set, um, that's where something like Zeppelin, something that's already, you're basically submitting it to the same Spark app that's already running um, and so their executors are run in node managers, Yarn containers. Um, so in EMR, we set all these uh, by default for you, depending on the instance size, how much RAM and, and cores are on that node. Um, but it's useful quickly to go through on just some of the different settings and what an executor's built up. So um, you know, at the base, Yarn node manager has an uh, amount of memory. It's, it's set by the setting in Yarn site. Um, and that's the uh, total amount of memory that node manager can use when, when creating Yarn containers. Um, the executor containers are created um, in Node Manager, or managed by Node Manager. And each executor container has some memory overhead um, for Yarn, roughly about 10% of the size. Um, and then the actual memory that's uh, being used to execute jobs, cache RDDs, and that's set by a value Spark Executor Memory in Spark default. Um, the Spark memory fraction inside, actually there's some overhead in the Spark Executor Memory. The, this Spark memory fraction um, dynamically manages um, execution, but also the cache for an RDD. Um, and before, you'd actually have to set both, um, but now Spark will just manage it depending on how much you're asking to cache versus how much it needs um, to execute. Um, so you can set all this statically, and a job will go, and it'll create the number of executors you ask for with the amount of RAM and the amount of cores. Um, but EMR, actually, around EMR 4.5, by default, we use a feature for Spark on Yarn called dynamic allocation where Yarn will decide how many executors um, it needs uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the duration of the job and then you know, scale up and scale down depending on, on the resources needed. Um, we, the way we do it is we actually look at your node type, figure out um, you know, what's, what is the you know, way to utilize most resources on that node, and then we set those parameters for the number of cores. Um, and the amount of RAM for each executor. But these are all over, you know, you can override whatever you want. And in some cases, it might be better to have, you know, a few large executors because the amount of data you want to cache can't actually be distributed among, among many of these. One other thing to note is that a Spark job, as of right now, can only have one executor size throughout the job. So you can't have heterogeneous executors in a job. There's a JIRA open for that. Um, and you'll hopefully soon you'll be able to have you know, one executor with you know, 10 gigs and one with 20 gigs in the same job, but today all the executors are homogeneous. Um, here's a few properties. Um, you, know, you, can, you can tell Spark dynamically allocate resources, but you know, I need at least 10 executors for every job, whether you think I do or not. Sometimes Spark will, or Yarn might under provision, or you might say, look, I, I want you to over provision for a reason because I know the nature of this job and you know, you're gonna need those executors. So there's a variety of, of different settings. There's also settings for how long you might cache a data frame as well. Um, you could say, I wanna cache the data frame for you know, any data frame for 20 minutes, but then after that, you know, release the memory and, and somebody else can use it. Uh, Spark defaults are pretty easy to override. Um, you uh, can do it you know, with EMR, you have what's called a configuration object. And the configuration object allows you to uh, specify a bunch of overrides for any of the key values in any of the settings. Um, and then when we create the cluster, we will uh, change all those settings to what you wanted it to. And if you add in new nodes, will you still utilize the settings that you wanted to change? In this case, here's an example of overriding um, executor memory and executor cores to 15 gigs of RAM and uh, four cores. 
Um, and that's when you're creating the cluster, you can override this. But you can actually override it at runtime as well. When you submit a job to Spark, there's a bunch of flags that you can use um, to say, you know, even though the default is 15 gigs of RAM now, I want it to run with 10 gigs, and you submit that when you also submit the job. So all the settings are pretty fungible, and you can quickly iterate and figure out if you do want to tune, you know, what makes the most sense for your job. Um, and as I said, there's a few reasons you might want to change things. Um, also, if you knew that you were running one like long-running single tenant cluster, you might just want to have one large executor on each and tell the Spark application to use up, you know, ear earmark all the resources from my Spark app, and um, you know, it, no one else is going to submit any work, so you're not going to need to like save any for somebody else who's submitting a new job. So there's a bunch of different reasons um, why you can tune, although as I said, you don't have to. Um, if you did want to have one large single tenant app. Um, we have a setting maximized resource allocation, um, and that basically under the hood does a bunch of math and comes up with what it, you know the executor settings. If you wanted to run one executor on each instance, you know is about as large as it can get, um, and then we will, you know, when you submit a Spark app, it, the the number of executors is set to the number of nodes you have, and it basically will take up all the resources for that one single tenant application. So say you're running a Spark streaming job, and you know that you're not going to be submitting any other jobs. That job's been running for a long time. Um, you can utilize this to easily just have it configured to create one large Spark app on your cluster. Um, a few tips for data frames. Um, you know, same thing with the S3 before. The less data you scan means the less data that you're sending over the wire, which means you know, better resource utilization, but also jobs will go faster. Um, more partitions will give you better parallelism. Um, you can adjust that using Spark default parallelism and adjust that setting. Um, a lot of times that will give you a little bit of a performance boost as well, tweaking that setting. Um, and then also just thinking about how you're caching data frames. Um, you can set it so actually a data frame can only be cached in memory, um, and that's the memory only setting, but you can also have the data frame uh, spill out to disks, but you're gonna eat up some IO cost when, when processing it. But all of those are tweakable settings. Um, also the default serializer makes a difference. The default is Java, but um, you can set it to Cairo as well. Um, doesn't support all the serializable types. And also, serialization in when you're using data sets, which I brought up earlier, is actually a bunch of custom encoders that are now being used there. So there's going to be probably some shift to using whatever these um, you know, native uh, encoders are in Spark. But with Spark 161, um, you know, this is still uh, more or less true, uh, depending on what you're doing. And that's the setting that you can use to change uh, the default serializer. We'll end real quick with just an overview on uh, Spark security. One, one key concept is uh, VPC. So when you're launching a Spark cluster, um, you'll launch it in a virtual private uh, cloud in AWS. That's basically a logically isolated area of the AWS network. And you can choose two different subnets types, a public subnet, which has an internet gateway to communicate out um, you know, to the public IP range, or a private subnet that doesn't have an internet gateway. Um, and depending on your use case, you know, there, there are ways to run uh, Spark securely in both. Um, but EMR, is, you can run it now, start, you know, a couple months back, I think in December, we announced support for launching in private subnets. We've seen a lot of very security conscious customers, just their network topology uses a lot of private subnets. It's easy to launch there. And you can also create an S3 endpoint in the, in the private subnet as well. So that really locks down your connectivity. However, you can uh, create a NAT if you're using a private subnet to call, allow uh, the nodes of the cluster, because remember this is an EC, basically EC2 instances that make up the cluster, to call out to the public range or to other AWS public APIs, like you know, AWS KMS doesn't have an endpoint in the private subnet yet if you're using that for keys. Um, but you know, that, that's a way, this is one way to securely set it up. You can also run in a public subnet as well. Um, also, you can control the traffic into the EC2 net, uh, nodes of your cluster using security groups. Uh, by default, EMR closes all of the ports um, to any outside traffic except for port 22, which is to SSH, and you can open up a tunnel and access the web UIs in that way. But you can tweak all of, the, uh, all of these settings as well based on uh, you know, your, your security needs for that cluster. Um, there's a bunch of other security uh, features to think about um, that are options that you have uh, when running Spark. Um, the first is just encryption options. If you say it was important you to encrypt all of your data at rest and in transit, um, you, you can do this. Uh, EMR out of the gate and actually uh, Spark in general 
uh, open source HDFS encryption. Um, HD, HDFS transparent encryption basically is client-side encryption for HDFS using the Hadoop KMS service for keys. Um, you can easily enable that. Um, you can encrypt local disk. Uh, when executors spill out to disk, they write out to local, not to HDFS, um, and temp directories on each node. So you'd have to encrypt that node locally using something like Lux. Um, EMRFS supports a variety of S3 encryption. You can have S3 managed encryption with server-side um, encryption, manages the keys and does the uh, encryption cycles on the server-side, or you can uh, use your own uh, HSM or your own uh, key vendor and use client-side encryption, which encrypts things locally on the EMR cluster and then writes out an encrypted object to S3 using uh, envelope encryption in the S3 encryption client. Um, so basically, it's uh, transparent to Spark, but however you've been encrypting data in S3, at least with EMR, you can plug directly into that um, and, and work with whatever security controls you have in place. Uh, for in-flight encryption, data between S3 and EC2 is encrypted with SS using SSL by default. Um, HDFS blocks, remember HDFS is shuffling blocks around at times to rebalance. If you're using HDFS encryption, that's done client side and uh, everything is encrypted in flight there. Um, and then Spark for a Spark shuffle um, utilizes uh, SASL with a Digest MD5 and that's not what we consider the strongest encryption. It's not as strong as uh, AES-256, but it's still a level of protection higher than, than unencrypted uh, data over the network. Um, I brought up VPC for access control, or actually permissions. Um, you can utilize IAM, which is basically AWS Identity and I Access Management, which uh, gives permissions to AWS resources or users uh, interacting with AWS resources and APIs. Um, so there's a lot of control over locking down, uh, you know, what buckets uh, your cluster can go access in S3, um, you know, who can create, in this case, an EMR cluster. You can put limits on all of these different things. Um, you can also uh, Kerberize Yarn um, as well, so at the application layer. So when you log in, um, you know, you can, uh, you know, approve or deny people interacting with Spark based on uh, permissions that you give at the application layer as well. Um, Broad VPC and security groups to lock down your network access. Also SSH keys. Uh, with EMR, we put an SSH key on the master node, and that's a way to access the Spark API or you know, uh, bring up web UIs with using port forwarding. The demo I showed you, I was SSH to the master node and was accessing uh, the web UIs on, on that node. And then finally, auditing AWS CloudTrail is a great way to audit um, AWS API calls. So who's creating EMR clusters, who's adding steps, who's creating EC2 instances, um, all that can be tracked and processed from AWS CloudTrail. Um, and also with S3, um, there are S3 uh, logs which can track who's accessing what object. Um, you know, and all, even in EMR, we can inject the YARN application ID to see what I, you know, actual jobs have been touching uh, different objects. Um, that was a lot quickly. A lot of this is in the EMR docs, so I'm happy to talk more about Spark security um, after the session. Anyway, thank you everybody for, uh, for your time. Um, and it looks like we have a little, how much time do we have left? Because we started the timer. Seven minutes, so we could take a few questions uh, as well. Thank you.